Okay, thank you for inviting me again. Tonight's subject will be a current look at the tramway light railway scene <clears throat> in parts of Scandinavia based on a visit this past July, intermixed with a few views from previous journeys. Because of time constraints this past July, I did not go to Stockholm and Norrköping in Sweden and did not give some of the traction properties I visited before sufficient time to cover their entirety, as my main purpose was to examine new developments that have taken place in the last few years. The light rail revolution is what I like to call the return of streetcars and now light rail to places from which they had once provided public transport, but were later abandoned, as well as the building of new systems in areas where they had not operated in the past. As we all know, in North America, it started with Edmonton in 1978 and was quickly followed by Calgary and San Diego in 1981. And soon the recreation of tramways in cities that had lost them spread to many countries in Europe and other continents as well. After living through the destruction of many of the streetcar networks in the US, I was elated by this welcome, even surprising development and began to travel to as many places as possible that were introducing new systems and new lines. In the past few years, the number of additional locations where this has occurred has decreased, probably because the ones most likely to succeed have already been implemented. Thus over the last few years, the newest examples of this phenomenon have tended to be geographically spread out, making it difficult to visit a concentration of the latest ones in a practical compact itinerary. But there was one exception in the last few years. Three new systems opened in Scandinavia. These are Aris Denmark in 2017, Lund Sweden in 2020, and Odense Denmark in 2022, which are, quote, are quite close together. I hope you can see my cursor but mm -hmm. here is Lund in Sweden, down here is Odense, Denmark, and up here is Aarhus, also in Denmark. The distance around the triangle circumscribing them is under 400 miles, with each leg of the perimeter less than 150. I should mention another system that opened during this period, Tampere, Finland in 2021. It is much further away and with new tramways also coming to the Helsinki area, testing and some operation have already begun. I hope to say that for a future journaling journey. Actually, one can say Australia offers an opportunity similar to that of Scandinavia with four new systems, for me at least, going online since my last visit. Thus, it was serendipitous that last spring, I received notice that the convention of the VDVA, a German electric traction group, would take place in Norway and Denmark toward the end of July. A traveling companion, Karl Heinz Rover of Hattingen, Germany, had joined me at a previous convention of theirs, one that covered the Baltic States and Finland in 2017. And both of us found a number of activities scheduled for this year's meeting be of interest. What? So we decided to see if we could join in. Particularly attractive to us were planned events in Trondheim and Bergen in Norway. Trondheim being up here, Bergen over there, and Oslo over in that area. And that also included museum visits. And the fact that the Danish National Tramway Museum, and I'm now going to try to pronounce these Scandinavian places, but I won't be very good at it. Uh, so please uh, pardon me. Uh, the, the Tramway Museum, Jolden Eshom, would be having its Members' Day open house during that period. Carl Heinz, who was with us on this Zoom program tonight, and I would also visit tram museums in Oslo and Göteborg, Sweden. With the help of Lars Richter of Hamburg, Carl Heinz and I arranged to join him and the group for the Trondheim and Bergen portions of the convention. 
We soon organized our hotel, flight, and train reservations, and I crossed the Atlantic on July 16th. We were wary of the weather, however, as forecasts indicated rainy days throughout. But as it turned out, even though there was some rain every day, we also had a certain amount of clear skies, as you'll see in many of the photos. And while the Northeast portion of the US experienced very hot and humid weather during that period, with temperatures reaching as high as 95 degrees, we had cool weather. The thermometer did not even reach 70 degrees until the day before the end of the trip. Because my itinerary called for a large amount of time to be spent in Trungim and Oslo, I will go into the rail operations in those cities in greater detail than the other places I visit. We will start in Trungim, the place I flew into from the US, and then go on to Oslo, Bergen, and Gothenburg, or Jutteburg, before looking at the new streetcar systems in Lund, Odense, and Aarhus. Finally, we'll finish with the Danish National Tramway Museum and Copenhagen. To get to our starting point, I ended up aboard three flights, first to Amsterdam, where I connected to Oslo, and finally to Trondheim. The itinerary held up, and I arrived at Varnes, Trondheim's airport, only 23 minutes late out of a total of 10 hours in the air during an elapsed time of 15 hours. I had to wait an hour for Carl Heinz's flight to arrive, but because it was a few minutes late, we unfortunately missed the 5.03 p.m. DMU train to Trondheim. Thus, we took the opportunity to take a few photos during our hour's wait for the next one. But unfortunately, the skies were incredibly dark, as was the color of the trains. So I'll only show this one. They weren't dark because it was late afternoon as the sun sets very late in the evening in central Norway during the summer, but because of very thick cloud cover. Our train on timetable route IR70 was a Stadler built class BM76 flirt dual mode electric, diesel electric MU purchased a year or two ago. It is operated by SJ Nord, a subsidiary of the Swedish State Railways, which bid and won the contracts for operating much of Norway's rail system. I've ridden similar but diesel only units on Texrail between Fort Worth and Dallas Fort Worth Airport, and on Arrow, the new rail service between San Bernardino and Redlands, California. In fact, a hydrogen powered unit will be tested in Southern California later this year. It was a ride through hell to get to the main railway station in Trondheim, literally. The annunciator in our MU set displayed the next stop to hell soon after we left the airport station. Our train made nine stops and took 38 minutes to reach Trondheim Central for a senior fare of about $2. Bedtime was around 10 p.m. and it was still light out. But just before that, we saw the Perla an Aida Lines cruise ship heading for the slip behind our hotel. Those circles throughout this image came from within the glass and explained why the windows of the hotel, as we approached it from the street earlier, looked totally opaque. That treatment prevents those aboard the Perla and other ships from peering into the hotel Clarion's bedrooms. Trondheim, located along the fjord of the same name, is the third largest city in Norway with a population of about 215,000. The Torvet, or Market Square, is in the heart of Trondheim's city center. Its center hosts a statue of Viking King Olav Frigvason, the founder of the city in 977 AD. Va Frua Kirka, the medieval church of Our Lady, is in the background. The sky in this view is an accurate portrayal of Trondheim's weather, and so it is not surprising that there is a street, Thomas Agnjata, that celebrates the rain with a display of umbrellas as art. I should mention that on my only previous visit to Trondheim in 1987, it rained so furiously and continuously 
that after a round trip on the tram line, Claire and I retired to a movie theater where we saw a Mel Gibson, Danny Glover movie, Lethal Weapon. There is but one streetcar route in this small city whose terminal is about two blocks west of the location of the previous slides. This is the downtown area where my cursor is right now. Thus, an explanation is warranted regarding why we decided to spend two days here. As mentioned earlier, the VDVA was starting its convention in this location, and their schedule called for an all-day fan trip that would utilize a vintage motor trailer set in the morning and two heritage motors in the afternoon. But Lars had pointed out that Trondheim has a number of other museum cars that are fit to operate. So we just, he suggested that we come a day early and have our own private charter with a few of the other units. And so we did. The one line in this attractive city is called the Grockelbahnen. Founded in 1924 as a private suburban railway, the meter gauge route was acquired by the municipality in 1966. It was merged into the city's tram and bus system in 1972, becoming the network's fourth tram line. The local system goes back to 1901, by the way. During a major political controversy about the future of the city's tramway, with the mayorality and the city council bouncing back and forth between pro and anti-tram parties, the city purchased new rolling stock for the line in 1984. But then, after another shift, abandoned the entire network of tramways just four years later in 1988. Fortunately, the Grockelbahnen's infrastructure and equipment was left in situ as a combination of local rail enthusiasts called Friends of the Grockelbahnen, politicians, and residents living along the line put forth plans to privatize it and operate it without public subsidy. The idea captured the imagination of the more conservative politicians, those who originally led the fight to abandon the money losing system entirely. And soon a corporation was set up to take over the line and return it to operation. To make a long story short, a new company, A.S. Grockelbahnen, started service over the line two years later in 1990 with volunteers scraping the asphalt off the rails where the tracks had been paved over. The operation was so successful that it was acquired by Connex Veolia, a multinational transportation operator, now known as Transdev, which actually runs the streetcars in Cincinnati and Milwaukee, as well as bus systems in many other US cities. After a management buyout about a decade ago, it is now a part of a national transportation company and is called Boreal Norge. Compared to our hotel at the harbor beyond the railroad station, and this is where the hotel was, the terminal of Prandium's traction line at St. Olaf's Gata is located on the opposite side of the city center. Thus, we got a good look at the downtown area during our daily walks to and from the tram line, which included navigating a bridge over a canal that feeds the Nedelva River, which runs through the town. The two earlier photos of the town came from these walks. The Grockelbahnen is five and a half miles long and runs from the city of Trondheim in a southward and then westward direction to the suburb of Leon, climbing steadily from sea level to about 900 feet. With 18 intermediate stops, it runs on meter gauge track under 600 volt DC overhead with single ended equipment that has a wider loading gauge compared to most narrow gauge rolling stock. Named after the Grakalen, an 1800 foot high mountain known for hosting leisure, leisure activities like skiing, hiking, and so on, it is now the world's northernmost tram line ever since the abandonment of trams in Archangel in Russia in 2004. It carried some 1,100,000 passengers in 2022. On this Robert Schwandel map, note the combination of single and double track and that there are only two 
three loops on the line where the single-ended trams can change direction. The line's downtown terminal is along the curb of a rectangle, and that's over here, of one-way street, single track circumscribing four streets counterclockwise. It operates for about three quarters of a mile on street track before turning onto private right of way after the ELA stop at the edge of town, which is over here. The St. Olaf's Gata shelter serves as both the last stop of inbound cars and the starting point of outbound ones. Since we took a number of trips on the line aboard a mixture of trams at various times over our two day stay, I had to give a great deal of thought about how to present this portion of the report. A chronologically oriented narrative would become repetitive and disorganized in terms of photo location, and one that is based on the evolution of the rolling stock would be disjointed in time and geography. So I decided to order the photos by distance from the inner terminal to best describe the line. So now in geographical order, here are some views starting with the inner portion. Lars had arranged that we would pick up our first chartered tram set at the Munkvall car house at 10 o'clock, mainly to avoid paying the cost of deadheading the equipment to the downtown terminal. And by riding a regular service car, we would get the opportunity to preview possible photo stops on the inner portion of the line. Thus we, five of us, including Daniel Joseph who's with us tonight, gathered at the St. Olaf's Gata and Gata is spelled like gate, G-A-T-E, and in Norwegian translates to street as opposed to avenue or road, in time for the 915 departure of our revenue car. One of the disadvantages of vis visiting Scandinavian cities in the summer is that a great deal of its resident population is on vacation, and that results in lower ridership and less staff available for operations which is manifested by reduced frequencies. So instead of the Grockelbanen running on a 15 minute headway during this season of long days and short nights, service is operated only twice an hour. We asked the staff why service couldn't at least run every 20 minutes, but we were told that the location of the passing sidings requires either a 15 or a 30 minute frequency. After buying, Day tickets from a vending machine, we positioned ourselves to take our first photos. Surprise of surprises. Just prior to the regular car, just shown coming in, a two-car train of heritage rolling stock approached. It turned out that this unexpected pleasure was a charter for one of the day excursions offered to the passengers of the cruise ship that was tied up opposite our hotel. And that explained why we noticed that a very large number of people were waiting at the stop. We would come across this motor trailer set again. And here a few minutes later is our car, number 99 at the same place, turning from Koningsgata into St. Olaf's Gata. Note the beautiful wooden buildings, a quintessential feature of Trondheim. These cars constitute the revenue fleet, which operates every half hour in the summer but every 15 minutes at other times. Part of an order of 11 single-ended high floor trams from Linka Huffman Bush in 1984 and originally numbered one to 11, only six remain operable. The seventh on today's roster is currently out of service. Here's another view of one of Grockle Bond's LHB articulated units running on Kongensgata. These two section cars are now 60 years old and thus are way due for replacement. According to Urban Transport Magazine, a tender has been issued for eight new 100% low floor cars expected to cost some 56 million euros. If everything goes well, they should enter service in 2027 or 2028. Further on, after Kangen's Gata becomes Ilavolen, track work was underway to bring the infrastructure up to date. One of the VDVA's charter cars from July 19th is shown operating wrong rail after traversing a temporary switch. 
The summer half hour headway certainly helped keeping service on time during the reconstruction period. At Ila, the double track turned sharply from the east to the south, leaving the street and entering private right of way. LHB built car 97 in advertising livery is shown running outbound to Leon at the Burke's Ligata stop. Ostensibly wrong railing, like the tram in the previous photo, these view illustrate how the summer track work has resulted in the inbound rails being used by cars in both directions. The platform for inbound streetcars is out of sight, located right beyond the curve in the back. I'm sure you've noted the handsome temporary wooden platform for outbound cars. Two stops further on, the topography has risen sufficiently to offer some good views of Trondheim Fjord and the harbor. VDVA chartered car seven is shown at the Bergrensen station where a brief section of double track functions as a passing siding. Note the simple shelter. Here, another view of car seven, this time on our return trip, waiting for an outbound regular to pass. And now here it comes. After by Grenson, the line reverts to single track. The next station, Belvedere, turned out to be an ad hoc stop for our private fan trip on the previous day as the clouds parted for just a moment and the sun shined on our tram set. And for the first time, we actually saw shadows. We couldn't resist, so in unison, we immediately called photo stop. After Belvedere, the line sports a relatively long stretch of double track, which runs through the bridal blick stop and ends just beyond Nordra home, which turned out to be an excellent location for photos. Beautiful summer wildflowers dot the right of way surrounding Nordra home station. This photo was posed to emphasize the natural arrangement of the flowers. Let me go back to that at that location and was taken from just north of the inbound platform. Here a revenue passenger is shown waiting for a regular car that would pass us before our charter could proceed. A highlight of both charters was the posing of our fan trip equipment on the single track trestle that crosses the valley between Nordrahum and Sondrahum stops. The Hum viaduct, Humsbra, is some 300 feet long. Here, car 29, chartered by the VDVA, is shown, while this view from the car shows our group photographing it. When it comes to electric traction enthusiasts, similar similarities exist worldwide. Car seven is shown at the point of a two car lash up, pausing for photos on our private charter one day earlier. Note the fjord in the background. In 1951, the steel trestle replaced a wooden one that was built in 1924, the year line, the line was placed in service. A newspaper photographer captured the original structure for posterity that year. Rockelbahn car number one was one of four built by Hanover Wagenfabrik, Hava, with Siemens electric equipment. After more than 40 years of service, cars one to four were retired in 1968 and 69, with number three from the original series preserved at the local Tramway Museum. We will look at the museum and its preserved rolling stock in a few minutes, as well as the operating roster as we continue toward the center of Grockelbanen's operations at Monkball. Monkball is two stops beyond the trestle at which line, the line single track briefly becomes double to service both the museum and the company's shops. I don't have a digital camera <clears throat> or a drone, but I'm able to access Google Maps and can manipulate the software to provide an aerial view of Munkfall Station, its building and turning loop. The inbound and outbound platforms of the Munkfall stop are shown in the center of the photo, which includes a small building where waiting passengers can 
get drinks or snacks. The bottom left area in shadow shows where the single track splits into double, virtually a mirror image of the track shown at the top right. And it's up here. The building at top left houses the offices, shops, and car house of Boreal Bana, operator of the tramway. It was constructed in 1984 and replaced in function the original red building from 1924 on the other side of the tracks, which now is the car house of the Sporis Historisk Forenning, Trondheim's Tramway Museum. The structure in front of it is the museum itself, while the building at bottom right over here is a nice Italian restaurant where we five weary travelers had lunch after the end of the VDVA's charter on our final day in Trondheim. Now for some views at surface level. Tram car 29 is shown pulling trailer 71 on the charter for the Aida Cruise Company, a German subsidiary of Carnival, who shipped the Perla, as mentioned early, docked in front of our hotel the previous evening, July 17th. The single-ended motor was built in 1957 by the Norwegian car builder Stroman and is one of four of the same series that are preserved and operable. Trailer 71 is a bit older, originally built for Belgium's Vicinal Tramway in 1951 and sold with two others to Trondheim in 1956. The end of the turn back loop is shown at right. It is also used by cars pulling out from the car house en route to the low, northern end of the line in the city of Trondheim. A view of the motor trailer set we chartered on the morning of July 18th. Wooden four axle cars number seven and 55 were built by Hoka, also known as Hanafus, in 1955 and ran on the Grachelbahnen until 1973. The order consisted of just this one motor and trailer and was the last executed before the line was bought by the municipality. The seven was utilized as a work car from 1980 to 1988 when it was donated to the museum. On July 19th, the VDVA used car seven without the trailer for a second charter of the day. The name of the tramway's operator, Boreal, is quite prominently displayed on the shop building and its logo, a vertical stylized infinity sign, also appears on many buses in the area. The first two views, first of two views at the southern end of the complex. The building shown at right with the concrete steps is the museum's display hall and gift shop. Inbound revenue car 97 is shown approaching the Monkwell stop. The track at right leads to the Grachelbahnen's original car house used by the museum since 1988 when Trondheim's tramway system was closed down. Here, Heritage Car 21 is spotted for our seventh charter on the 18th. The four-wheeler was built by Scabo in 1914 for Trondheim's local tramway and was donated to the museum in 1981. 12 of these motors were supplied by Scabo in the years 1913 to 1917. They continued in revenue service until 1955. After a big fire in 1956, they were put into operation again until new, until new cars were delivered a year or two later. Five of these became work cars, but three of them were scrapped in the 1970s. Number 21 was what work unit no, number 42 in, until 1979 and was reserved in 1981 with restoration coming in 1986. The Tramway Historical Society was formed in 1979 and developed the museum here in Monkville. The museum itself is usually open on Wednesdays through Sundays from 12 noon to 3 p.m., but also opened its doors for the five of us on Tuesday. And on the 19th, staffed by knowledgeable and very friendly local electric transit enthusiasts, it was under siege from the entire VDVA group who almost both bought 
the entire place out. In addition to cars from the Grockelbahnen, its collection includes many trams from the city system. Its website provides a brief history of the organization, indicating it was established in time to rescue most of the big collection of, quote, veteran trams that were kept by the company, which had a tradition of storing old cars rather than scrapping them. I mentioned earlier that the Grockelbahnen was taken over by the city in 1966, and its operation was merged with the three-line local system in 1972. These lines were closed forever with the Grockelbahnen in 1988, with the latter being reopened in 1990. I must mention that in 1956, the city system suffered a major car house fire, which destroyed all of its modern equipment. Fortunately, its older cars were still stored at another facility, and many of them, including the 1914 series that included number one, 21 were placed into service until, until new cars could be delivered, which was quickly accomplished. Retention of its older units also proved serendipitous for the preservation movement. In 1988, with the closing of the system and the moving of its most recent cars away from Monkwell, all of the buildings at the site became available. That was temporary, of course, as when two years later, the line was brought back into service, its previous car house and shop became its operating headquarters. Fortunately, the old car house and the garage were soon given away again to the museum, and it was granted the funds to convert them into the present facility, which was open to the public in 1995. Because of this history, the museum now has a comprehensive collection of the tram types that operated in Trondheim. I can't help comparing its collection to that of the Baltimore Streetcar Museum, which has rolling stock of its city dating from the horse era to PCCs. I should mention that the Grockelbahnen and the city's local tramway, the Trondheim Sporve, originally numbered their cars independently, so there is duplication. The former's are now usually given the prefix GB, with the latter TS. The inviting exterior of the main building of the museum. Part of the collection on display inside is detectable behind the windows. The side facing the tram stop contains a collage of sculpted art featuring the flags of Norway and Sweden, as well as a tram and historic local architecture. And now some views of the portions of collection. Many of the cars are operable. TS number 12 is an open platform four-wheeler built by Scabo in 1903 for Trondheim's local tram system. TS number 33 is one of 10 single truckers built by Hava in Germany in 1921 for the local tramway. It was sold to the Grockelbahnen around 1958 or 59 and then was used as a work car until 1968. TS number 19 is one of 28 four axle cars built in 1957 by Strumman for the local tramway. It was demoted to rush hour only service in 1984 and ran until the system was closed in 1988. The yellow and red livery was introduced in 1974. In the winter, many of the Grockelbahnen's trams were equipped with ski racks, as the Leon station at the end of the line is adjacent to a network of hiking and cross-country skiing trails. A tour of Boreal's car house and shop allowed me to photograph GB car 5, which is undergoing restoration. GB number 5 and 6 were delivered to the Grockelbahnen in 1943 by Skabo Jern Bana Vogen Fabrik during the period when Norway was occupied by the German army during World War II. Number six only got its motors in 1950. Both were renumbered to 35 and 36 when they became work cars in 1973. Number 36 or six was scrapped in 2005. 
After suffering an engine failure in 1978, CAR 35 was put into operation, operating condition as passenger unit five in 1988. I was somewhat confused about cars five and six as the original program for the VDVA's July 19th event called for the operation of car six as the third charter of the day. Unfortunately, number six unexpectedly developed mechanical problems during the previous week and was going undergoing repair. Anyway, before I learned about the dual numbering system, I thought the six was a sister car to the five, but it obviously is not. It is TS number six, one of 12 units built by Scabo in 1938 and 42, the city's first double truck units. Five of these were destroyed in the Carborn fire. The remainder were retired in 1959 and number six was turned over to the museum in 1981. It had never operated on the Grachelbanen in revenue service. This is a photo from the museum's website. A result of car six's unavailability, the VDVA had to modify its plans and ended up using motor trailer set TS-29 and 71, the same ones used by the cruise company on our first day, followed by car GB-7, but without trailer 55, which we used on the first day. We finish up our coverage of Trondheim with photos of the two mile long western portion of the Grachelbanen, running from the operations center and museum at Munkval to the end of the line at Leon, which we rode on both days. It has five way stations and a passing track at Ugla. The highlight for me was traveling aboard TS Car 21, the 1914 built four wheeler through flowering meadows, woodlands and open country. Our chartered single trucker just west of the platform of the first uh, stop, the first after Monkball. The turning loop at the Grockel Bonin's outer terminal at Leon as seen on the VDVA charter. Some, mainly from the superior sex, might say these photos would really be good if those funny looking vehicles weren't in the way. There is only a single platform at Leon as cars wait for time at this point after dropping out one passengers while inbound, inbound ones board. At way stations on single track, there has to be two platforms to serve the single-sided cars. For the sake of obsessive mileage collectors, our four-wheeler made it to the bumper block, make that bumper pole, just beyond where the main line track starts a counter clockwise loop to head back to Trondheim. <clears throat> Excuse me while I grab a drink. Looking west from the platform of the Herblo Sun Yapa stop, the first inbound after the Leon terminal on a run by. Contrast of the new and the old at Ugla stop, the only place on the outer end of the line where cars can pass. Number 99, one of the seven Linka Hoffman Bush motors used in regular service pauses at the outbound platform while our 1914 built single trucker waits for the signal to proceed down the single track back to Munchkull. Our two days of charters were excellent fun and we even got a glimpse of the sun here and there. A reporter and photographer for a local newspaper, the UK Adressa, was along for the VDVA event on July 19th and published a photo essay describing the trip. They seemed to have enjoyed themselves too and were especially impressed and flattered that a visitor from the New York area was present. We returned to our hotel in the late afternoon and had small suppers prior to going back to the railroad station with our luggage. By now we knew the lay of the land and rode a Route 25 bus to the station where we checked in for our overnight room in a sleeping car from Trondheim to Oslo. The, part, the compartment was equipped with comfortable lower and upper berths and had sufficient room for our bags. The train moved out of the out 
on the advertise, 2317. And before we knew it, it was time to get up and dress for our 650 arrival, which was on time. While we knew our room in the Grand Central Hotel, where have I heard that name before, would not be ready this early in the morning. When we arrived at the hotel to leave our luggage in their storeroom, we were treated to a full complimentary buffet breakfast. We would spend the day Thursday, July 20th, riding and photographing Oslo's transit system. Now I will have to switch to another folder. So bear with me for a moment. doesn't want to go to the map. Anyway, here we are. Oslo, the capital of Norway, has a population of about 650,000, which is about 12% of the entire nation. Thus, it is luck roughly the same size as Boston, Massachusetts, and Portland, Oregon. And one could argue that its transit system is similar in many ways with two intertwined rail networks. The municipally owned standard gauge system is named Sporvan, formerly Oslo, Oslo Sporvier, and operates a five line, 53 mile heavy rapid transit system and a six line, roughly 30 mile tramway. Until 1925, the city was named Christiania, we would spend most of the day riding and photographing the tramway, Sporvay and Tricken, the green lines on the map, but not totally ignoring the metro, Sporvay and Tibana, the red lines. My first trip to Oslo was in 1960 with fellow ERA member Richard Solomon before the advent of the metro, but at a time when a number of interurban and suburban electric traction lines were operating with classic rolling stock. Claire and I have traveled there on a number of occasions since, some in conjunction with visits to distant relatives of hers. Some of the streetcar lines I rode and photographed over 60 years ago were eventually incorporated into the rapid transit system, and it was probably no coincidence that in the same year, 1960, Oslo decided to abandon the entire tramway network. Buses had slowly begun replacing streetcar routes right after the war, but the first to die were those mainly served by single truck cars and trailers running on narrow streets. The most modern cars at that time were the four axle gulfisk or goldfish cars with their sloping rear ends that resembled a fishtail, plus a series of 50 Hoka modern PCC-like motors that were delivered between 1952 and 1957, somewhat like our chartered car seven in Trondheim. Both of these photos were taken from the internet. Fortunately, that decision was reversed in 1977, despite the advent of the first Metro line in 1968 and its forthcoming absorption of part of the tramway network. There are now six through rooted tram lines with four long ones reaching out into the suburbs. A number of the busier trunks have two routes and one even three. All service is now provided by three series of articulated cars purchased from 1982 to the present. These are the two section six axle high floor SL79 cars that were delivered from 1982 to 1989 numbers 101 to 140, the three section partly low floor cars, 141 to 172, built from 1998 to 2006, and the recent five section 100% low floor units that, that began coming in in 2020 and are still arriving, number 401 to 487. Our hotel room was exceptional, mainly because of the view which looked out onto Strangata, where trams on the 11, 12, and 19 lines operate. Two versions of the high floor six axle articulated SL60, 
79 units can be compared in this, in this and the following view. An example of the first 25 cars of the 40 in the series is shown here. Duvag built the first 10 in Dusseldorf, Germany in 1982, while ABB completed the order with 15 more in Strumman, Norway in the following year. Note that these single-ended SL79-1 cars have a rear door on the left side. Another order for 15 more of these cars was built by ABB Strumman in 1989 and 90, and the last unit of that series is shown here. It is a modernized version without the left side door and is classified as SL79-2. As the fir first batch of cars, SL79-1, were placed into service, the 1939 built Goldfish trams were retired with their last operation in revenue service coming in 1985. The next order for rolling stock was built by Ansaldo in Italy in 1999 and 2000, carrying numbers from 141 to 172 and classified as SL95s because they were ordered in 1995. The heavy 70% low floor, eight axle double enders were delivered late. They've been quite troublesome, especially in freezing weather. Their technical flaws include corrosion and high noise levels, but I think they're very attractive to the eye. The westbound Route 17 car pauses at the Yern Bonnet Torget stop along Biskup Gunnarosgata. The 37 story Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel in the background is the tallest building in Oslo as well as all of Norway. The Oslo city building is a vertical shopping mall. The operation of these cars allowed Oslo's remaining four axle cars, which consisted of the aforementioned Hokas plus secondhand cars from Göteborg to be retired. CAF built Airbus 100 car 418 is shown at the Stortevot stop in the Centrum, Oslo city center. The five section 100% low floor unit is en route to Grefsen Station in the northeastern portion of the city. Forvin ordered 87 of these double-ended cars in 2018. And by the time of our visit, the first 24, starting with car 401, had arrived. When all 87 are delivered by the end of this year, these new class SL-18 units will comprise the entire fleet of the tramway. It is highly probable that the newer SL-95 will be removed from service before the SL-79s. There is an option for 60 more of these if plans to increase the size of the network are consummated. This photo came about on my trip to Oslo in 1991. In the center is four axle Tatra model T7B5 car 200, which Oslo Sporvier began to test on July 18th of that year. It is between cars 140, the system's newest at the time, and number 271, a rebuilt four axle unit. The Hokas were reconstructed from 1952 to 1958 and thus some were nearing 40 years of age and needed replacement. As a result, Oslo was planning another order for new cars. At the time, the Iron Curtain rusted away and the communist dictatorships of Eastern Europe fell. Czechoslovakia had hoped to be able to complete, com compete in the free world's economy. And so an order for these low cost cars would be mutually beneficial. But that was not to be. After the 200 ran in test service for about 18 months, an order for the new articulated cars was given to Ansaldo in Italy. The line to Colsa still had overhead wire and was served by both streetcars and metro trains on that memorable July 18th when I wandered into the Albos Depot beyond Yar. <clears throat> Today, the wire is gone and third rail powers that stretch of track. 
with Oslo's shared tram metro operation remaining only between Yar and Bekestwa. When I entered the property with my camera, I saw that a press conference was being held. An official came over to me right away and asked, first in Norwegian, how did I find out about this event? Because he said it was top secret. I told him it was just fate that brought me here. And he invited me aboard for its maiden voyage to the city center. Quite coincidentally and serendipitously last July, I rode the Tatra unit again, which now has a different number and is located in a different city, but I'll get to that later. This view from 2016 shows an SL95 turning from Perkeristan into Biskop Gunnaraskata as it approaches its Yernbana target railway square stop. The tower of Oslo's main cathedral, Damkirka, lo looms in the background. The building was constructed in the 17th century and was remodeled on several occasions with the dome being added around 1850. Oslo's civic center and inner harbor lie to the west of the city's railway station and main shopping area. Hosting city hall and other traffic generators, the Pippervika neighborhood formerly housed shipyards and industrial buildings. This is the first of two views of SL 79 tram 106 from either side of the Aka Briga stop alongside the inner harbor of Oslo Fjord. As can be imagined, this stop is an important transfer point to the ferries that run to various islands in the fjord and to suburban areas south and west of the city. The building to the right of the tram is a wing of the the National Art Museum. The taller modern building behind it houses a hotel and shopping mall. This photo from 2016 shows an SL95 car running on Radhuskata alongside the attractive Contras Garret. The park serves as a connecting entranceway to the medieval Ackerhus fortress and castle and includes a statue of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now we will leave the city center and move on to a few other lines, starting with a very scenic one with lots of private right of way that runs to the south side of the city. After leaving downtown, its tracks proceed along a steep curving hill from sea level to a plateau almost 400 feet high, providing attractive views of parts of Oslo's harbor. This line, which runs through Liabru, is served by routes 18 and 19, and was the first line we rode on July 20th. Glimpses of the city center and waterfront can be obtained from the trams climbing the hill to reach the elevation of the neighborhoods on the east side of the Oslo Fjord. The line gains some 200 feet between the Oslo Hospital and Erkebog Park and stops approximately a 5% graze. The SL95 tram is en route to Liabru in this photo from the 2016, when the line was served by routes 18 and 13, instead of 18 and 19. This view was taken from Kongsveen, the road that parallels the inner portion of the line and shows an expanded view of what can be seen by tram riders. Another view taken from Kongsvian, this time with the camera facing further right toward the city center. It shows Oslo's own twin towers in an area that is primed for mixed residential and commercial development. The black and white skyscraper to the left of the towers is the Deloitte building in Oslo's opera quarter, which is served by the Bjork Vika stop of the 13 and 19. The 19's next stop is Yernbana Torget at the railway station. If you look at it straight on, the building is supposed to resemble today's universal barcode. I leave it to you to make that judgment. The Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel is prominent and to its left is the almost as tall Hot Husset, home of both Norway's postal service and Oslo's afternoon newspaper, 
the Afton Postman. Formerly the three, the 4.1 mile long privately owned Eckeberg Bana, the line through Yabru opened in 1917 with 1200 volt DC overhead, which meant its tram ran at half speed during Oslo's that through Oslo's downtown streets. First was by the city in 1948. It wasn't integrated into the network until 1965. This view by Kurt Ram Rasmussen for Wikipedia in 1971 shows one of the Eckeberg Bonin's motor cars, which operated until 1973, when the line's DC voltage was reduced from 1200 to 1600. In the early 1950s, new bodies had been built over the original 1917 trucks and electrical equipment. The Holtet Depot is about halfway down the line. We came upon refurbished double-end work car 357 on its grounds. I also visited that depot in 2016 and saw the same unit. It is one of three built by Haglund in 1989 and 1990 with trucks salvaged from Gothenburg's M23 streetcars, which were built in 1948, and other electric co components from 1958 built M25s. Both types of cars served in Oslo before the first batch of articulated cars came. Haglund built M29 cars from 1972 are still running in Göteborg, but probably not for long. We saw some of these PCC style units in that city on July 25th. Beyond Holtet, the cars run at top speed between the trees for five stops, two and a quarter mile to the end of the line at Liabru. An outbound SM79 car approaches the Kostolet stop about halfway between the shops and the outer terminal. An outbound SM95 car heads towards the Liabru loop. A third track used as a siding can be seen in this view, while only the outbound track is shown as the LRV slows for the curve leading to the platform, which is used for both arriving and departing passengers. We now move from the eastern or southern end of Route 13 to look at its western portion beyond Oslo Centrum and past its junction with Route 12 as Soli. The route continues along Dramensveien, a long street that winds through a neighborhood of large homes, many that could accurately be described as mansions. Capital cities throughout the world have exclusive residential areas where many countries choose to lo locate their emb embassies, but few have a streetcar line going past their front doors. This one, Gimla, is home to the highest real estate prices in Oslo. An eastbound Route 13 car from Bekestwa slows down for one of the many curves along Dramensveien in this leafy view. This neighborhood sports the Skarsnaparken Park at left with the embassies of Iran, Afghanistan, South Africa, and Egypt nearby. Another large residence along Route 13 in the Gimla area. And yet another. This photo is unusual as it's of a single-ended SL-79 car operating on the route. Because the Bekestwa end of the line is only equipped with crossovers, these cars, mainly used on rush hour short-term journeys, loop at Liliecker and then return toward the city center. A rear view of an outbound SL95 car on Route 13 stopping at Liliecker. The line was extended to terminate at this station in 1919. Five years later, the line was pushed even further westward to Yar and its current terminal at Bekestwa. In rush hours, single-ended SL79 cars are assigned to the short turns, which terminate here on a loop that is just beyond the background of this view. The 13 is still called the Liliacra line by many of its riders. Right after its next stop, the 13 is joined by the Kolsas line of the Metro Route 3, and that's over here at the top of, 
of this track map. And they share the double track for three more stations, Yar, Ringestabek, and the 13th current terminal at Bekestwa, which was reached in 1924. The line was extended further to Kosas in 1930, but was not connected to what is today's Metro until 1942. And that's up, at, up here. At that time, tram operations were cut back to Yar while interurban style trains ran through to Kosas. Since then, that portion of the line has been operated as a part of what became the Metro system, except for a period around 2006 when it was shut down for total rehabilitation. High level platforms at Yar and beyond were built in 1980 and third rail installed in 2010. The overhead wire was retained until 2011 when a new layout was constructed to allow the extension of tram service to Bestwa. The track map from gleisvan.eu for the territory between Bekestwa and Liliaker shows the tram platforms in green and the metro platforms in yellow. The metro, Tibana, continues to Kosas beyond Bekestwa, while the SL95 double-ended Route 13 cars use the center track to change ends. And that's over here. As just mentioned, rush hour SL79 single end cars run only, run only as far as the loop at Liliacre, which is over here. SL95 cars on Route 13 glide by the high level platforms at the eastern end of Yar Station, as these are used only by Metro Route 3 on its trains to Kosas. While at the western end of the station, the right-of-way widens briefly to four tracks to allow the trams to stop at low-level platforms. The layout permits Metro trains to run past inbound SL95 trams like this one, which is stopped to pick up passengers. Inbound, transferring riders from the Metro to the tramway usually change at Bekestwa, although if they're coming from Ringstabek, they have to transfer at Yar. Ringstabek station, with no low level platforms, Route 13 trams were by, with only Metro trains stopping. We'll continue with Oslo's Metro or Tibana for a little while longer. Today's Metro consists of five lines with 53 miles of route. A good argument can be made that it began with Oslo's first electric interurban or suburban right railway, the Holman Coal Bond, which is now Route 1. And that Route 1 runs out all the way out here. It was completed in 1898 and ran in a northwesterly direction for about four miles from Majerstuen, where it connected with Oslo's fledgling tramway system, with passengers had to use to reach the city center. 10 foot wide wooden cars made principally out of teak were introduced in 1909. And by 1916, the line was extended into the suburbs to its current terminal, Frogner Seterin, reaching its current 18 and a half mile length from Meyerstuen. With the outer end of the line at an altitude of some 1600 feet, it became an instant success carrying skiers in the winter and hikers in the summer. The history of the system is much too complicated to go into detail here, except to say that all lines are now operated using third rail and have been through routed via four and a half mile long tunnel under the city center since 1993. And that turn, tunnel starts at Mount Yerstuen and runs this way. Some of the branches on both sides of the tunnel date back to streetcar operation on surface tracks, similar to New York City's BRT, BMT in Brooklyn. So let's go right back to the Colsus line where we just looked at joint operation of the Metro and the tramway from Yar only as far as Bekestwa. But back in 1960, 
when the Cosas line, now Metro Route 3, was equipped with overhead. I was standing right next to Richard Solomon with my camera when we both took photos of the two types of equipment standing side by side. His slide was digitized, and that's what we're looking at. We were pointing our cameras westward toward the front of a 1939 Scabo built goldfish tram that would operate over what is now Route 13 through downtown and on to Bowler in the southeastern part of the city. Bowler is now a stop on the eastern end of Metro Route 3 to Morton Rudd, whose inner portion was converted from the former Austin Yo tram line. The rear of double ended light rail vehicle. 409 is shown operating outbound to Colfas. The 409 was one of 17 such C-class LRVs built for the connection of the line to a Holman Colin in 1942. From that time on, passengers could reach the city center either by surface running streetcars or the light rail line. A second view of car 409 at Yar Station. Note how simple the dual height platform is. Perhaps today's overbuilt version, which you saw before, might have been designed by a consultant. A view from the internet of wooden Holman Colin Bacar at National Teatro Station soon after the one and a quarter mile tunnel from Meyer Stewen was built in 1928. This was the first part of the common tunnel that now serves the Metro. As mentioned before, home and colon rail cars were built of teak. Enough, another Richard Solomon view from 1960 with the home and colon line at a way station. These cars looked older than they were, with many having been built after the war. I couldn't help comparing their construction to barrel staves or the equipment that I used when learning downhill skiing actually in the same year, 1960. Now back to Meyer Stewen Station, the beginning of today's Metro Tunnel. As mentioned, as I just mentioned, the portion to National Teatro was built with overhead power in 1928. In 1977, it was extended to downtown where it met the third rail operated initial portions of the Metro. Screw running did not start until 19, 93, however, when the first of these lines were converted to third rail operation. The center track was and still is used for layups and for short turn. Same busy station last summer with today's MX 3000 series three car trains. Siemens built the 345 units used on the t bana between 2007 and 2012. Another view from 1960 showing a station master dispatching trains. By then, the Holman Colin Bonin had been absorbed by the city and four branches were using the station. Some of these T cars remained in service until 1995 when the last of the Western lines was converted to third rail operation. Over 60 years later, the track layout has not changed much. Meyer Stewen is only a few blocks away from Oslo's Tramway Museum, Boer Vase Museet Vogenhall 5, which occupies Oslo's old car house number five. Formerly connected to the streetcar system, the museum, which dates from 1966, is currently isolated, though no longer offers trips with operable cars in its collection. But the tracks are still there, so there is hope for the future. Of special interest to Americans is reserved horse car number six, one of 22 such units built by John Stevenson in the US in 1875 and 1877. Descriptions of all the trams are provided in Norwegian and English. After electrification of Oslo's tramways from 1899 to 1900, this car was used as a trailer, at least until 1913. Number eight is one of the Holman Colin Bonin's first motor cars and dates from 1898. 
built by Shuker, these four wheelers were mostly taken out of service when the wide double truck units came in 1910. But some still lasted until the tunnel was built in 1928. No. Number 32 was built by UEG Falcon Ride in 1899 for the electrification of Christiana's Horse Railway. The single trucker was relegated to work service in 1913 and continued working until 1979 when it was turned over to the museum and then restored. Number 96 represents some dozens of single truck double-ended units built by various manufacturers for the streetcar system between 1909 and 1914. There were two companies, the KSS, Christiania, Four Vessels Gob, and the KES, Christiania Electrica Forve, that held franchises until they were municipalized and merged in 1924. This type of car was common to both. The larger of the competitors was the KSS with nine lines, while the KES had only four. Number 307 was built by SSW Herbrand for the KES or Blue Tram in 1913. It was converted to a work car in 1968 and was finally retired in 1993. After the 1924 merger, it operated as car 108. It is very similar to the preceding number 96. The KSS was known as the Green Tram as its cars were painted that color until the merger. Number 121 was built in the shops of the KSS in 1922. The four-wheeler has an interesting history as during, the world, during World War II occupation, it was seized by Germany for operations in Munich. It only got as far as Cologne, where it operated from 1944 until it was damaged by an Allied bomb in 1945. In 1946, it was returned to Oslo and repaired going back into service in 1950. This series of cars was phased out in 1966 and 67, so it is quite possible that Richard and I rode aboard them on our 1960 trip. There's the 121 on the streets of Oslo that I showed originally. We finished the Oslo portion of the program with a view of SL79 car one. Oh, I have to, I'm missing a page here. Okay. Hold it one second. I'm reading this from something that I wrote prior and uh, there it is. Number 163 is the last remaining prototype Goldfish or Goldfish car. Six prototypes were built in 1937 with some 40 in that rollout of these iconic aluminum streetcars coming between 1938 and 1940. Because of this car singularity, it was taken out of service in 1957 and then was hidden on a remote siding to avoid scrapping until the museum obtained it in 1970. Sound familiar? The main series of cars with their characteristic sloping rear end resembling a fishtail remained in service until 1985 when there were enough new articulated units available to retire them. 20 were built by Scabo and 20 by Stroman. Note the ski rack. Number 234 is a Hoka car built in 1957. Newer than the Goldfish, these double truck Swedish style units shared the city's rails until their replacement in 1990 with the completion of Oslo's first order for articulators. Number 1001 was built in 1917 for the opening of the Eckeberg Bonnen. The narrow ends of these large cars permitted them to negotiate tight curves in the city center, but forced their doors to be placed in their centers away from the cab. Note the low floor entrance. As mentioned earlier, these cars operated 
under both 600 and 1200 volt overhead. Built by Scabo, they were nicknamed Viking ships and number 1001 carried passengers until 1957. This is the car's original paint scheme. Single-ended number 1013 came from a later order of similar cars for Scabo in 1932, increasing the roster to 16. They were capable of running up steep grades with a trailer at a speed of 30 miles per hour. These cars were taken out of service with the integration of the line into the municipal tramway network in 1974. Back on to the Metro to Forks Nings Parkin, which is served by lines four and five. This is on the Sunbon line, which was opened in 1934 as a branch of the Holman Colon Bon. The purpose of my travel to this point in 2016 is that tram lines 18 and 19 cross under the Metro's elevated structure here. This view from the inbound pl station platform at Forksing Sparkin shows the SL95 low four articulated cars, specifically number 164. From the surface, a Metro train can be seen at the station in this view of the same SL95 unit after it changed ends at the Ricos Hospitalit terminal to stop beyond this point. And here are two of the latest CAF Erbos 100 cars on the 18 and 19. We finished the Oslo portion of the program with a view of SL79 car 138 at the Kjelsas terminal of routes 11 and 12 in the northern part of the city. Note the mural depicting a streetcar, further indicating that the trams of Oslo are well loved. And now we'll have to switch to another folder. And I'm going to take another drink. We chose to visit Bergen on Saturday, July 22nd, because that was the day the local Cranway Museum would host the VDVA group. Bergen, the nation's second largest city with a population of just under 300,000, lies roughly 300 miles west of the capital on a peninsula and fjord by Fjorden along Norway's coast that fronts on the North Sea. There are four express trains each day between the two cities five in summer, that take about six and a half hours to make the trip. Thus, we would take the scenic train ride through mountains and valleys one day before the event, and then return over a slightly different route two days later. This is one of the photos I took out a window on the 8.25 a.m. train that brought Carl Heinz <coughs> and me to Bergen at 3 p.m. on the dot. The operator is Vi the new name for Norwegian state railways. Here is a view of the facade of the 1913 built Bergen station and its brightly lit interior, which still retains some of the infrastructure of the past. This three car class BM69D EMU was built by Asia Stroman in 1983 before the car builder merged with Brown Boveri to form ABB. After 40 years in service on the Vossebanen, a commuter regional rail service that serves nearby communities from the four track stub end terminal in Bergen, they were recently replaced by new Stadler Flirt EMUs. This is a view from 2022 by photographer Marek Greff. Upon exiting the station, we thought we would see a scene like this, a photo from my visit in 2014. But while waiting with our cameras at the ready, nothing came along. 
Walking further along the tracks towards our hotel, we saw a rusty rail at the terminal and notices indicating service for the summer was cut back two stops to the bus station. Not the end of the world. Bergen is surrounded by mountains and this view near the bus station from 2014 illustrates the topography of the city, which is served by two light rail lines. The Bybonen, as the network is called, was opened with a short segment in 2010. The single line was extended on several occasions since, and, November, and in November 22, a second line was opened. The system now has 34 stops over 18 route miles. Here's a close up from 2014 near the city's bus terminal. By that time, the first extension of the first line was completed to Langunen, an elevated station at the road interchange that serves suburban feeder buses. By then, the line was eight and a quarter miles long. Our July visit was after two more extensions had been opened, and line one reached its maximum length at 12 and a half miles. The most impressive looking piece of infrastructure as to the system is the skew arch Birkeland Skiffet Bridge over the Flypath Wegen, the main access road to Bergen Airport. After we checked into our hotel and walked back to the bus station to ride the new extensions, the sun had made an appearance. A second view from the Birkeland Skiffet stop, two before the end of the line. The final station on line one is an underground cavern at Bergen Lufthaven itself, where it is only a short walk to the departure gates. The five mile long line two was opened on November 21st, 2022. The route adds a second path leading into the city's downtown area, which is crosses under the first line at Crostant, at Crostant Station. Part of the track connection to line one is shown at right. On our only full day in Bergen, Saturday, July 22nd, the weather became typical for that city where hotels have a large supply of umbrellas on hand to lend to their patrons. Rain alternating with clouds and sun. While we didn't get soaked, our decisions about where to stop for photos had to to be based on trying to avoid being outside during many of the downpours we experienced while riding. Over half of line two is located inside two tunnels. The longest, just under two miles underground, has an intermediate set of portals that connect with the Bogbonin second car house via a Y. This view is just short of the Frillingsdalen terminal of the route. There is a parallel tunnel for pedestrians and bicycles. There are additional, there's an additional seven tunnels on route one. So if you have a pension for photographing streetcars at portals, Bergen is the place for you. This photo from 2014 is at the Paradis stop of line one. This one also from 2014 is one station further at Hop. Back to last summer, upon entering the Vergas line station of line one, we glimpsed something that made us get off our LRV. At first we thought it might've been a trailer from the city's legacy tramway that had been abandoned in 1965. But on close inspection, it appeared to be a reco trailer from East Germany. Apparently it was an unneeded trailer from the collection of the Bergen's Elektriska Sporve or Bergen Electric Railway, the city's trolley museum. Located less than a mile from the city center, on Saturday morning, Carl Heinz and I walked from our hotel to the Bergen Technical Museum in the Marlin Rice section of town, which houses the streetcar collection and many other exhibits that deal mainly with transportation subjects. The museum first opened in 1990 and contains exhibits from 14 different organizations. It is situated in the 1913 built car house, formerly used by the city's legacy tramways, which 
was closed down in 1965. Using the same name as the city's former legacy streetcar operator, the Bergen's Elektriska Sporve operates ex-Berlin ex -Berlin Reco Car 61 over a one mile long heritage line on Saturdays and Sundays in the summer and just Sundays in the spring and autumn. The single trucker was reconstructed in 1967 in East Berlin from a car whose trucks date back to Falcon Rudd in 1913. It was obtained with two other RECO, as in RIC construction motors and some similar trailers by the museum group in 1996. The museum also acquired car 47, a 1913 built four wheeler from Oslo. Earlier this program, we saw similar cars in the Oslo Museum collection, specifically numbers 96 and 307. This unit was built by Scabo in 1913 as part of orders for 120 such cars for both the KSS and KES companies from various car builders. Many of these single truck units continued in passenger service in Oslo until the late 1960s. I've been unable so far to find out anything about car 150, but hope springs eternal. And then, is number 10, Pride of the Museum's Collection. Built by Falcon Ride for the opening of Bergen's first tramway in 1897, this four-wheeler is operable, but because of its frail condition, runs only on special occasions. Nevertheless, the museum folks did bring it out into the daylight so members of the VDVA group could get photos, as long as they had wide-angle lenses, of course. On my first visit to Bergen in 2014, I got in touch with an American expat, Tom Potter, who invited me over to the museum. He kindly took me for a spin in Reco 62, sister of number 61, and here it's at the end of the track along Olaf Rius Bay, about six or seven blocks from the museum. The line has been considerably lengthened since then and now runs all the way to Engen for a distance of about, of about nine tenths of a mile with four intermediate stops. As mentioned earlier, weekend operation is open to the public. On this day, Reco Unit 61 was operating every half hour with a 10 or 11 minute running time on a single tracks in the streets to Egen, Engen, not far from the city center. This is the current terminal at Cafe Opera, where the car lays over for about four or five minutes. The weather on this particular Saturday was not as good as what I encountered in 2014. With significant support from Bergen City Council, plans are afoot to extend the line further into the old city and onto the port. And you can see the extensions in red here, while the existing line is in blue. Here are some additional photos on the hilly terrain navigated by the single trucker. This line was placed in service in 1911 and became Route 3 in 1919. The street network allowed for some interesting locations. The last of these is at the University of Bergen's Natural History Museum near the Botanical Garden. The Technical Museum also displays the pair of funicular cars that were used on the city's iconic Floyd Bonin from 1974 to 2002. These were the third generation of cars serving Floyan Mountain, which is one of several peaks surrounding the city. Claire and I rode in these cars on her first visit to Bergen and to Norway, in fact, in 1991. I haven't scanned the slides I took on that trip. Anyway, these units were replaced by new cars built by a company called Bangla that now serve Bergen's number one tourist attraction. The view easily explains its popularity. The meter gauge funicular was opened in 1918 and has three intermediate stops on its 2,769 foot, a little over a half mile run. 
which gains 991 feet in altitude en route to the peak. The VDVA ended the day with a trip on the Floyd Bonin, but Carl Heinz and I demurred because the weather had turned rainy again and our adventures with the museum, after our adventures with the museum's heritage car. As you can see in good weather, the ride offers an incredible view of the city and its harbor. And the next morning we rolled our luggage from our hotel for the 8 a.m. departure of our ferry from the port. Our return trip to Oslo was via the Nordled ferry up the coastal waterway and through the Sonja Fjord to Flam. We continued from there via a steep and scenic Flam railway to Myrdal, where we then transferred back to the Bergen Oslo line. This is a very popular tourist route because of the scenery and its use is advertised as Norway in a nutshell and Norway's best. The ferry trip takes four and a half hours and we were quite lucky that it did not rain. In the fact, the sun even came out on occasion. Norled is far from being the largest ferry operator in Norway as it has only 62 ships in its roster. Another view before we docked in Flam. The trip over this route was well worth it despite its extra cost and the length of time it added to the journey. Flam, because it is the transfer point between two legs of a popular tourist excursion, has become quite a traveler-oriented locale with museums, restaurants, and shops of all kinds offering all sorts of activities. I think it's no coincidence that there was a two and a half hour layover here before the departure of our train. And it worked. I had so much time here that I bought presents for my wife, family, and Norman Olsen at one of the many shops. According to Wikipedia, Blom itself has a permanent population of only 35, but receives some 450,000 tourists every year, and its harbor hosts about 160 cruise ships during that time period. There was activity on the railway, specifically the arrival of an incoming number while we were there. Locomotives of the EL-18 series are used on the line. 20 of them were built starting in 1996 by Adtrans Stroman, successor to ABB, Sia Brown Bavari. The former independent car builder is now Bombardier Transportation Norway and is owned by Alstom. These are the only electric locomotives on the roster of Norway's rail network. All other scheduled trains in Norway are MUs. Sadlo recently won the contract to replace the locomotive wall train with new long distance version of Flirt EMUs. Some 17 eight car Flirt Next trains with reclining seats, food service, family areas, and lots of lug space will debut in 2026. Some of these trains will off also contain sleeping compartments for operation on overnight runs, like the one we rode from Trondheim to Oslo. One of the round trips on the Oslo-Bergen line operates overnight. Except for bedrooms, this concept seems to be the same as Amtrak's for the Northeast US, as our agency has ordered 83 aero trains from Siemens to replace today's Amfleet. I don't know whether the Norwegian trains will also have fixed concepts. The Flam line is only 12 miles long, but very steep and scenic. Running time between the terminals at Flam and Myrdal are just under an hour, but that includes a stop where passengers made a train to view a huge waterfall. This line's maximum grade is 5.5%. Our train is shown about to pass its opposite number at the top line's only passing siding. The state railway system built the line in 1940 and electrified it in 1944 during the German occupation. In 1996, it was privatized with ownership now resting among various regional governments, but it's still operated by VI. As a result of its independence, fares were raised to reflect 
the tourist nature of the operation. In fact, they are highest in the summer when nine round trips are operated every day. Electrification is at 15,000 volts AC, 16 and two thirds cycles, the same as mainline railways in Sweden, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. One of the many waterfalls that can be observed by passengers. There are 20 tunnels along the line, including a spiral one like the Canadian Pacific's route through the Rockies. It also has a horseshoe curve. The thundering waterfall at the Keofossen stop, which is at an altitude of 2,200 feet. Trains pause here near the line's mid-roll end for five minutes. Our connecting train to Oslo at Myrdal with the same kind of locomotive. Myrdal is 2,800 feet above sea level. All in all, the elapsed time for today's ride was 15 hours compared to the six and a half we experienced in the other direction. Time to switch again to another folder. Monday was spent in Oslo, which included our visit to the Kramer Museum, many of whose exhibits I showed earlier, and then an afternoon train to Gothenburg or Jotaborg, which took three and a half hours for the 180 mile trip in EMU cars. Jotaborg, with a population of about 600,000, is home to a large modern 12 line tramway system that blankets the city. For some reason, I did not get there for the first time until 1991, but have since made up for that lapse in judgment. Most of the trackage is segregated from automobile traffic with the outer lines in many cases totally grade separated. The system was 75 miles, and I wanna go back to this picture, of route was inaugurated in 1902. Its history is illustrated by a large collection of heritage cars. Here is number 92 at the railway station, operating on a Summeroni heritage line through downtown to Liseberg, the city's huge amusement park. The four-wheeler was built by ASEA in 1917. The ride takes about 15 minutes each way with service over the two mile long Lis Liseberg line and usually provided by two cars running on a half hour headway. This is car 129, also classified as type M5, but built three years later in 1920. Number 133 is a third M5 available for service on the line, but shown here pausing for passengers at one of the five intermediate stops it makes. I took this a few years earlier. Number 71 is also an M5. It and its sister number 79 were sent to the US. The 79 is still at the Trolley Museum of New York in Kingston, but number 71 which has been acquired by the, which had been acquired by the Brantford Trolley Museum, was returned to Göteborg and now resides at its tramway museum. This photo of it crossing a branch of Connecticut's Farm River is compliments of Jack Hackner. Here is a photo of it I took inside Göteborg's museum in 2016. This photo of car 79 from Joe Frank's collection shows it's in operation under the BMT Culver line on McDonald Avenue on a fan trip over the South Brooklyn Railway in the early 1960s. One of the system's former car barns houses the museum, and here is another historic car approaching it from the street. Number 208, which is shown pulling a trailer in 2016, is a type M7 four axle unit built by ASEA in 1928. There is a huge collection of equipment inside the museum with many of the cars operable. Number seven, 507 is an open trailer occasionally used on the Liseberg line. The eight bench car was built by Vabis in Soda Italia in 1906. 
There are postcards showing Tram 15 pulling the 507 en route to Liseberg. Number 15 is an ASEA built M4 single trucker from 1902. Many of the deck roofed M4 cars had their platforms extended and to become M5. Number 208 and 302. The 302 came from ASEA in 1923 as an M8. Both these cars ran in revenue service into the 1960s. Number 143 was built by Hoka in 1953 for Oslo as car 201. Earlier, we saw a restored similar car, number 234, in the Oslo Tram Museum. After this series of cars began to be re replaced by Oslo's first low floor units in the 1990s. In 2003, this unit was sent to Yatterborg, where it, which numbered it 143 and placed it into work service. Sister Oslo car 271 was one of the three cars that appeared on the cover of the Modern Tramway November 1991 issue as shown before. Hagland built the single-ended M25 series the Yatterborg in 1962. These were the first of three models, the M25, M28, and M29, with PCC-style body, foot pedals, and MU controls, although they were not PCCs. At that time, people in Sweden still drove on the left side of the road, so these cars, when built, had its doors on the left as well. With the change in the rule of the road, Coming in 1967, they were gradually sent back to Haglund for rebuilding with doors being moved to the right side. Then in the months leading up to, and just after H day, the company operated one of each back to back in two car trains, one with a left side door and the other with a right side one. So all doors were on the correct side until every car was finally converted for right hand running. On one line where a loop had not yet been installed, two cars with doors on the same side were run in a similar manner to achieve the needed result. But only one car of a train had its doors on the proper side, temporarily reducing capacity. Car Builder Haglin was acquired by ASEA in 1972. Number 606 of the same series restored to its original color scheme but with the doors on the right side. These cars continued in service until the late 1990s. Number 61, which was built by Hagland in 1953, also survived the conversion from left to right hand running. The M23s operated in revenue service until the late 1980s. Number 63, a second M23 in the museum's collection is shown at the railway station operating in Liseberg service. Actually, our visit to the museum was at the end of the day. We spent the morning and early afternoon riding regular service. With 75 miles of route, we concentrated only on the lines working north from the railway station. That is, that portion of Robert Schwandel's Gothenburg train map. Here is the Liseberg, which is over here and Central Station, just to give you an idea of the downtown area. And here is the area that we concentrated on. I think you can see it with my cursor right now. Routes 6, 7, and 11. As shown by the thicker lines, a great deal of that section of route was built to light rail standards. In this case, that section begins just before Kvibberg, where this photo was taken. The M33 series, numbering some 40 Bombardier 100% low floor flexity units, consists of Jutteberg's most modern LRVs. The last of these three section cars were delivered just this past November. Here at Bergsjong, the line's endpoint, where Route 711 loop is car 439, one of 65 on Saldo Breda Surio units. Jotterberg chose not to have the stylized front end that is typical for the Surios for its 100% low 
low floor LRVs, which were built in 2004 to 2012. Now we go back five stops and through three of the line's five tunnels to Alagon Kirkan, the junction with Route 6, which does not travel over the whole line. The main line continues off to the right and then enters one of the tunnels, while the Cortadala loop of Route 6 is up the grade. Car number 323 is one of 80 formerly two-section articulated cars that had a low floor center section added between 1998 and 2002. They are now classified as M31s, but were M21s when delivered by ASEA as Jutteberg's first articulated units from 1984 to 1992. Before having its low floor center section added, M31 number 316 was number 216. Approaching 40 years of age, these are the oldest cars operating in revenue service in Yatterborg and are due for replacement soon. Some street running approaching the downtown area with an M31, followed by an Ansaldo Sirio at the same location. Now let's go back a few years when I concentrated on the Southern lines and look at car 844 on the light rail section of Route 1 heading towards Tineret. These M29 cars were the last built by Hagland and came in starting in 1969. Although appearing not to be on the road for summer schedules last July, this series of 60 cars will re be replaced by 40 M34 flexity units that were ordered from Alstom in 2022. The M34s, which will start being delivered soon, are a longer version of the current M33, coming in at five sections instead of three. Is it possible that more of these to be 150 foot long cars will be built as the contract includes an option for 20 additional units? Last but not least is car 100, the Tatra T7B5 that was demonstrated in Oslo in the 1990s. It was acquired by the Jotterberg Tram Museum in 1998. Carlson, Heinz, and I were treated to a ride in this preserved unit, concluding a great day in that city. The photo is at Linda Plotzen. Thank you, Rikard Agron, for all your help and kindness. The following morning, Wednesday, July 26, we left Jotterberg on a morning train for Lund. For the next four days, we were subject to the plethora of track work projects on both the railways of Sweden and Denmark that delayed us for a bit, but were not horrendous, unless you consider riding substitute buses for relatively short periods traumatic. Our first detour occurred because the railway from Gothenburg Central Station to the first station in the southern suburbs, Molndal, was closed for major inter infrastructure work. And here is Central Station at the top of the map and Moldau down here. In this case, however, since our hotel was between these two points, instead of starting out by going back to Central to board a replacement bus, we rode the transit system to the station at Moldau, which is served by Jotterberg Pram routes two and four. And while that allowed us to get in some more streetcar mileage, we were also disappointed that a portion of those lines consisted of a bus bridge. So we couldn't win either way, but it really was not that onerous. And since we knew all about it ahead of time, we just had to get up earlier in the morning. It took about three hours aboard a regional EMU to convert to cover the 180 miles to Lund, a relatively small Swedish city, city that never experienced a legacy tram system. Here is a photo of Lund's modern tramway at its inner end, looking from the railway station toward All Saints Church. Lund, with a population numbering about 100,000, lies in the heart of an agricultural district in Sweden's province of Scania, across the Arasund Strait from the city of Copenhagen in Denmark. It is also just 10 miles or 13 minutes 
from the much larger city of Malmo, which had a tram system that was closed in 1973, but retained a small amount of track used for a heritage operation. I visited Malmo for a Sunday afternoon in 2016, where I rode and photographed this 1907 tram. But back to Lund. The city's single tram line opened, opened on December 13, 2020. It's three and a half miles long and has nine stops. Travel time to its outer end at ESS is about 15 minutes. Here is one of the seven CAF Airbus 100 trams built for the line. ESS is the home of a pan-European research center. The windmill at right sits in a park. The tracks continue from this point through the car house and loop, not it, and going in that direction and not obviously in revenue service. The city opened a two and a half mile busway in 2003, but found it to be insufficient for supporting its plans for development something that is common to most BRT systems, but being ignored in places like Atlanta, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh, just to name a few. It studied other towns and cities in Europe that had installed new light rail lines, finding clear links between the creation of new commercial and residential development and decreased automobile usage in those places. Thus, it was decided to replace the BRT system with a light rail line, and also use it to promote acquiring technical research center as it has a major university. That worked and the facility at ESS and an additional one at the next stop, Max 4 were created. I'm just going to repeat a description of these two facilities from the internet because my understanding is limited. ESS is the world's most powerful neutron source. Its work is described as material research through the bombardment of powerful neutrons. Max, it is said, makes the invisible visible by producing high quality light from brilliant X-ray beams for research into life sciences and materials. Anyway, this photo was taken at Solbjör, three stations down from the upper end of the line although not describing, described using the American term transit-oriented development, this is clearly a good example of it. The district is called Brunschag, and it will eventually house 40,000. It is described as, quote, a smart city with smart buildings, a sustainable space, and efficient urban environment served by solar power. There are a number of other traffic generators on the mostly grassed in double track standard gauge line, including the university, a hospital, and various business parks serving the research communities. Among them are Telephone Park, Ideon, and Medicon Village Science Park, all served by the light rail line at the four interstations. Naturally, the Swedish telephone giant Ericsson is located at Telephone Park. The building in the background in this view from the Idion Torget stop serves the university's chemistry and chemical engineering departments. Looking here in the outbound direction from the Idion Torget platforms at commercial development and a central station bound CAF car. Service was operating every 15 minutes, but timetables indicated that trams ran every 10 minutes in rush hours. After about three hours in Lund, where we experienced sun clouds and even a little rain, we reclaimed our bags from a locker and boarded the next train to Copenhagen. Service operates over the 35 mile distance approximately every 10 minutes with a running time of 50 minutes, including a stop at the Danish capital's airport. It operates via the new Orison Bridge and Tunnel across the strait of the same name, separating Sweden from Denmark. The five more mile crossing with the railroad tracks on the lower level opened in 2000, and it traverses one of the waterways that connects the Baltic Sea with the North Sea and thus the Atlantic Ocean. 
At Copenhagen, we took the next train towards Odense, where we would spend the next two nights. Unfortunately, the ride was interrupted as we had to transfer to a bus bridge due to the Danish state railways performing track work on its main line in both directions around that city. As a result, what should have been a 90 minute run over a 100 mile distance was substantially longer, resulting both from slower speeds on the road and the somewhat chaotic transfer between modes. Odense has a population of about 180,000 and is Denmark's third largest city behind Copenhagen and Aarhus. The nine mile long single route tramway was opened on May 8, 2022 and has been contracted to Keolis to operate. One of Odense's 16 Stadler Varioban trams is shown near the Odeon stop in the heart of the city. Like our previous day in Lund, we experienced sun clouds and rain during the time we rode and photographed the tramway. Like Lund, unlike Lund though, Odense has a legacy tram system, which closed in 1952. This photo is from the files of Denmark's National Tramway Museum, which we visited two days later. Called the Letbana, which translates to light rail, the new line has 26 stops. Two LRVs pass at the Odeon station after a brief shower. Almost the entire tramway is on reserve track. This section is just south of downtown between the, the Albani Torv and Odeon stops. Cars run every seven and a half minutes during both rush hours and midday. The southern terminal of the tramway is at Jalesa a suburban station on one of the state railway's commuter lines. Passengers can easily change from the light rail to DMU trains here. <clears throat> Frequent service on both systems operate to the city's central railway station. The difference is that there are just two way stations on the commuter line, but 16 intermediate ones on the LRT. One last picture of this very photogenic line showing a Stadler Variobahn car on the tree line reservation along Benedict Skada after leaving the Palnas Kovas Vej Vey stop. Boy, that's a hard one to pronounce. On Thursday, July 27th, we would travel from Odense to Aarhus and after sampling the new tram and tram train system would return to Copenhagen. Thus we took our luggage and luckily easily found lockers at the railroad station in Denmark's second city. Just like our trip to Odense, our trip from Odense involved riding on a bus around the DSB's summer track work. Thus our planned 90 minute trip over the 106 mile route was again long and tedious with a change of mode at Frederica instead of the previous change at Slagelsa. Aarhus has a population of about 350,000 and is the largest city in the East Jutland area of Denmark. It developed a plan for its tram system from the same re for the same reasons as Odense, specifically to support the elimination of greenhouse gases and fight congestion, as well as for moving toward increased housing density and to minimize the use of automobiles. The municipality aims to be carbon neutral by 2030. To meet these goals, the city built a new tramway and also electrified two of its suburban railways to institute tram train operations, where passengers from outlying areas are through routed to destinations within the city without changing modes and having to transfer from one vehicle to another. Specifically, the tram train system in Kassel, Germany, was cited as a model for what is operated in Aarhus as a two-line system. On this map, the red line is the tramway, while the blue is the tram train. Both are electrified at 750 volts DC, but for operating efficiency, two different types of LRVs were acquired. Both built by Stadler, the 12 tangos are capable of a maximum speed of 62 and a half 
miles per hour, while the 14 barrier band cars, like those in Odessa, for the local operation through the city, can only reach a speed of 50 miles per hour. Line L1 operates over the northern portion of the railroad line with the tangos, while L2 operates over the southern portion of the railroad line and through the city with barrio bonds. The RS, <clears throat> let me take a drink again. <laughs> The Aris Cathedral dominates the city's central square. It is the tallest church in Denmark, standing at 315 feet. Interestingly, a hundred years after the Reformation and the church adoption of the doctrines of Martin Luther, in 1642, the tower was struck by lightning and was not fully repaired until 1931. The first section of Aris's Lethbana from Central Station which is called Harvard Bonagard, was opened on December 21st, 2017, with further remaining portions going online within the next year and a half. This is the Stadler Vario Bond unit on Route L2's center of the, of the road reserve track, which is typical of its operation northward through the city center. Service runs every seven and a half minutes on the L2, as far as the university hospital where alternate cars turn back. The other two trips each half hour alternate between the branches to Lisbergs, Colon and Lystra. The service to the junction at Lisberg by Gada runs every 15 minutes. The next two views are from the platform at the very rural looking Lisberg by Gada station, which seems to be in the middle of nowhere. This one shows an L2 to Lisberg's Skolan behind a meadow, while here is a close-up of the actual junction itself showing a car coming in from Lystrup. The platform at Lystrup, where the L2 joins the L1 and terminates. At this point, both lines run on a half-hour headway. This was our first view of an Ara Stadler Tango it came with the bonus of having a Vario Bond car alongside. The L2 on the left lays over for eight minutes, arriving just before the outbound L1 and during the arrival and departure of the inbound L1, allowing efficient transfers between the two routes. I should mention that although the length of the entire system, including the tram train operation over the railroad, in other words, routes L1 and L2 combined is just short of 70 miles with 51 stops. As the regular tram route, the portion of the L2 north of Central Station to Lystrup, that represents the totality of new route construction cover and covers only seven and a half miles with 20 stops. While you can't see it here, the Tango car is about 23 feet longer than the Vario Bond unit. The L1 is the tram train and inbound cars proceed toward the city center and the central railroad station over a single track route every half hour. Very rural in nature, there are only four widely spaced stops before the railroad line joins the tramway. This is the one closest to the city, Aspana Torvet, which has a passing siding. Note the former railway station behind the Tango car. This contrasts with the 15 intermediate stops between Lystrup and Skolabakken on the L2. The difference in running time is 15 minutes versus 28. An L2 variable unit turns from Nora Bogada in the city center onto what becomes the joint L1-L2 line along Havnagada the road that runs along the basin of the Bay of Aarhus. It will stop at Skola Bakken and Dock 1 before reaching the Letmanis platform at Central Station. And L1 terminates, the L1 terminates at Central Station, but every four or eighth car on the L2 becomes a tram train and continues southward on the railroad. The lower performing variobound cars 
cover this section to the town of Otter. This is the Vibi Yalen stop. The SB mainline tracks are to the left and not electrified. Service over this segment, which like the L1 is single track, runs every 15 minutes during the school year and half hourly at other times. Back to the joint L1, L2 line. An inbound tango on the L1 arrives at Skolabakken alongside the harbor, while an outbound variobahn on the L2 approaches Dok 1. The modern building is a civic center continuing containing performance spaces, the public library and government offices. Aris has a legacy tramway. Aris had a legacy tramway, I should say. The meter gauge system closed in 1971. This four wheeler number three built in 1945 is shown at the Danish National Tramway Museum, Golden at Home, which we visited on the next day, Saturday, July 29th. And now we go to the last section of our uh, last folder. After finishing our work in Aarhus, we retrieved our bags and headed to Copenhagen, where we would spend our last three nights. Again, we had to use the bus bridge, but the additional wasted time was less as we were able to bypass Odense. We and the v DVA picked Saturday to visit the museum as it was traffic day and also members day. So the museum would be running everything that was operable and staying open late to allow members to run the cars. On traffic days, the museum also arranges for a bub public bus connection from the DSB at Borup to take visitors to its site. But this year it ran from Havalso because of the railway summer track work program. Upon arrival at the bus drop-off point and the museum's large parking lot, this is what we encountered. Speak of the devil, it was car three from the legacy system in Arvis. Three different meter gauge cars were operating in shuttle service from the museum's entrance and main parking lot to a central area where its car houses are located and standard gauge cars are dispatched. The second car was ex Boswell four-wheeler 213, built by SIG in 1933. And the third, Flensburg, Germany car 36, built in 1926 by Hava. These cars were operated to and from the entrance with the crew selling museum tickets to those not purchasing them at a kiosk near the entrance. After a ride of a little under a quarter of a mile, they dropped passengers in the museum's forecourt where a car house gained immediate attention. But the first tram I saw was double deck car 50, which was parked nearby and wouldn't operate today because of motor problems. It was built in 1915 with the Fredericksburg tramway by N. Larson's Vogen Fabriker, or the Larson Carriage Factory, a long established local firm founded in 1856. Fredericksburg is a small municipality completely surrounded by Copenhagen, and its tramway was merged into the bigger cities network in 1919. Although its area still remains independent to this day, this car, which was run in revenue service until 1933, is one of my favorites and was also loved by the late Dutch photographer and transit enthusiast, executive and advocate, Fritz van Dam. He took this perfectly framed photo at the museum and I've used it as my computer wallpaper since well before he passed away in December, 2011. The matching trailer number 78 was built in 1913 by the same firm. Then at Remisa One, the first car house, I came upon a streetcar that I've read plenty about but never encountered before. It was ex Hamburg Car 3060, one of Europe's pioneering PCCs. It was built in 1951 by Le Bourgeois in Belgium 
along with the first Brussels PCC, the 7000 series. Unfortunately, it was not successful in the West German city and was sold to Brussels to become car 7000 there. Its Danish connection was having been tested in Copenhagen in 1958, but it lost the competition to Duvac, which received the order. Many of the Duvac cars are still operating, but in Alexandria, Egypt. The museum has recreated two, repatriated two of them, and the front of one of them can be seen sitting to the left of the Hamburg car in this view. Riding this car last July was reminiscent of similar trips on car 737, formerly Brussels 7037 in San Francisco, the last of which was just a, two months, a few months ago. Here is the car from the same series as Hamburg 3060 at Pier 39 on San Francisco's Embarcadero this past September. It's painted for Zurich, a, city, a sister city of San Francisco. Speaking of Hamburg, car number 3657 from that city was next seen alongside a 1916 telephone kiosk from the aforementioned town of Fredericksburg. The 3657 was built by Frankenride at virtually the same time that PCC 3060 was constructed. The Market Street Railway in San Francisco has a similar car, number 3557, but it is out of service awaiting restoration. The Hamburg streetcar system was very unusual for Germany as trolley poles were used for current collection instead of the usual pantographs. Number 3657 ran in that Hanseatic city until the city system was abandoned in 1978. I remember their wonderful performance. They were very peppy and I enjoyed riding them on my visits there in 1960 and 1967. In fact, they were nicknamed Sambas, probably because it was said that standing passengers often were forced to dance when the cars turned corners at high speed or normal speed for Hamburg's motormen. Back at car house number one, which was built for the museum's opening in 1978. It has six tracks with the one on the far left being meter gauge to serve cars used on the shuttle to the museum's entrance. Car 824 is an old friend from when I lived in Den Haag in 1967 and 68. It was built by Le Bourgeois in 1929 and was still running in revenue service in 1960 during my first visit to that city. In my period of residency, one of this series occasionally could be seen and written in summer Sunday heritage service to the beach at Skaveningen. Single truck number 567 alongside was built in 1907 by the KS Copenhagen Spurveja, the municipal owner and operator of Copenhagen's trams. <coughs> Let me take another drink. <clears throat> Here is the museum's central terminal with its loading platforms for the cars that line up to navigate the main line, which is a little, little under a mile long. The standard gauge tracks, which were built around 1985, constitute the bulk of the museum's tram operations. The right of way was formerly a local railway in the area called Zeeland Midland, which was abandoned in 1936. I won't try to pronounce it in Danish. Hamburg car 3657, you've seen before, while car 74, the deck with a pair of Swedish flags is from Malmo. The car was built by ASEA in 1946 and ran till the system was abandoned in 1973. This is probably a good time to show you a map of this marvelous museum. At the lower right is the museum's parking lot and entrance. The meter gauge rails then proceed, di proceed diagonally past the tractorama, actually a garage featuring a big ESO sign used for rubber tired work vehicles into a loop 
which has a pair of tracks branching off. The upper one to track one of the main car house, Ramiza one, not so indicated. The other leads to a single track in Ramiza two, also not marked. But there is also a stub which will lead into an all meter gauge car house, Ramiza four, that is under construction. The remaining tracks in Ramisa 1 and 2, along with all the tracks in Ramisa 3, are standard gauge and serve the bulk of the collection. The three tracks between the car house are surrounded by the platforms used for passengers riding the bulk of the line. These three tracks then fold into two and proceed down Valbi Langada, a paved roadway that is lined by establishments that evoke main streets of the past. The rectangle of four rows in that area define the route taken by the museum's roster of heritage buses. Toward the upper left, at the end of Ramisa three, the pavement ends and the tracks begin, begin running on private right of way through a meadow until, until the Tobax mark and stop where they enter the woods and merge into a single track. Upon our arrival, the skies were very dark and it stayed that way for most of the day with occasional sprinkles and brightness in the distance until about five o'clock when the sun actually came out. As mentioned, the first segment of the line consists of street running through an area where the museum has recreated an authentic shopping street from the 1940s and 50s named Valby Langada after a street in Copenhagen. Duvag built GT 6890, one of the 100 two section articulated built in 1960 and 1960 for the capital of Denmark is shown right after being passed by ex Melbourne, Australia, SW6 car 965 from 1950. Another view along the pavement, which is shared with the operation of some of the museum's antique buses. Here, KS streetcar 71 bundles down the thoroughfare past period automobiles lining the curb, evoking the days when trolleys were part of streetscapes all over the world. The modern 701 was built in the shops of the tram operator in 1949 and carried passengers until 1967. At the end of the village, the tracks enter the interurban portion of the line, operating first through a meadow and then a wooded landscape with some occasional clearings. Here's inbound 797 making a transition from rural to a small town environment, like so many American interurban lines once did. The Reco motor and matching trailer 924 are typical of what was operating in East Germany after World War II and before Tatra PCC began making inroads. Both of these cars came from Rostock, the motor built in 1975, and the trailer in 1966. KS Scandia built four-wheeler 261 from 1907, pulling open bench trailer 1172 from 1909, and closed trailer 226 from, 19, from 1897, in the view looking in the opposite direction from the previous photo, toward the transition between street running and private right-of-way. Duvac 890 again, gliding outwards through the meadows. Of the 100 Duvacs, the 99 remaining GT6s were donated to Alexandria, Egypt in 1972, once it was decided to scrap the last of Copenhagen's tram lines. Two, number 815 and 890, were repatriated by the museum in 2001. Again, KS Scandia built four-wheeler 261 from 1907, pulling its two trailers, emerging into the clearing from the woods. The three-car lash-up is en route to the museum's central terminal. Right behind it was my friend 824 from Den Haag. The handsome peppy car was built by Le Bourgeois in 1929. This stop, called Tobaxmarken, is one of five intermediate ones between the museum's central station and the end of the line at Eiler's Egg. And then came number 22, 
the museum's other double-decker pulling trailer 283. The motor was built by F.C. Schultz in 1900, and the trailer is a converted horse car built by Mellum in 1872, probably the lowest unit, the oldest unit in operation on the museum's property. The line enters the forest here and becomes single track. The most beautiful station is the next one, Flemingsbinde. The waiting room dates from 1893 and came from a stop on Copenhagen's tramway. An exhibit about the Midland Railway that used this right of way until 1936 is inside. Inbound four axle 929 dates from 1934 and was built in the KS workshop for an independent streetcar operator in Copenhagen, NESA, which also supplied electric power to a part of the city. It Jack, its tramway Jack. to trolleybus operation in 1953 and was absorbed into a regional transportation agency in 1974. The pride and joy of the museum's collection, number 22 and 283, approaches Flemingsminde on an outbound run to Eilersegg. 1949 built Copenhagen number 701 at the same location. The clouds parted briefly. Here is the museum's only other PCC, number 7079 approaching Flemingsminde from the outer terminal. The Tatra T3 PCC for Prague was built in 1985 and came to the museum from the Czech capital in 2017. We should have a PCC like that running at one of our museums. Copenhagen's 1907 built car 261 and its two trailers approached the end of the line at Eiler's Egg. A similar view of Duvag's 890 in this beautiful scenery. On this trip, the 261 pulled only the open trailer. It is about to deadhead back to the museum before the skies open. That did not happen, fortunately, and the front blew over after a few drops. This is the loading point for trams returning from the outer terminal, Eiler's Egg. It really was dark, and I could not use my camera with this ASA 100 film and having a 2.4 lens opening. But I had my wife's digital point and shoot with me and captured this view of Melbourne SW6965, which was built in 1950. Note that there is a pedestrian overpass in the background of this frame. During the period of darkness, Carl Heinz and I wandered over to the overpass and attempted some photos. Since it was too dark for me to shoot film, I used both my phone and Claire's digital camera, but got nothing but blurs as the cars came hurtling by. But Carl Heinz had a better luck than I did. This is one of his digital photos, but like my view of the Melbourne car, not very contrasty due to the darkness. Car 100 was one of Copenhagen's first double truck units. It was built next, built by the Larson Carriage Factory as a double decker in 1901 and equipped with maximum traction trucks. Its top level was removed in 1924. Six axle 1957 built former Dusseldorf Rheinbahn car 2410 has been converted into a cafe car and on busy day like this one is operated to a siding in the center of the Eiler's Egg complex. In addition to serving sandwiches, snacks, and beverages, the staff also sells museum souvenir. At the edge of the picnic area at Eiler's Egg, a similar Duog built GT6 car number 2412 waits to be dispatched for the return trip to the museum central station. In a sense, this car turned out to be the prototype for the 100 Duvog units bought by Copenhagen starting in 1960, as it was tested on the streets of that city soon after it was built in 1957, roughly at the same time as Hamburg PCC 3060. Also notable, especially on my part, 
it was the car that the very accommodating folks at the museum let me drive to Eiler's Egg after dinner. Note that it is still light that far north around 7 p.m. I took this after my chance at the controller under the capable coaching of the young lady and the motor instructor right behind her in the window. At the controls is the next electric traction enthusiast that enjoyed the same generosity of the museum management and staff. One last view at Skjolden's home is taken after the sun came out. Would that have been like that all day? Single trucker number 470 was built in the KS shops in 1945. It's next to 567 from 19, 6, 1907, which I showed earlier. I saw many other cars, but it was generally too dark for slides. The kind and capable folks at the museum went all out to make this an enjoyable day with its volunteers running cars on a five head minute headway all day long. Now we will transition to our last day in Scandinavia, Sunday, July 30th, which we spent in Copenhagen. So first a view from my 1960 trip to that city taken by Richard Solomon showing double truck car 590, part of an order of 118 motor cars and 83 trailers that were built during the late 1930s and into the early 40s. They were called Lunding cars, Lunding Vogna, after the architect Ib Lunding, who designed them. Despite the introduction of 100 Duvogs in the 1960s, many were still running in February 1967 when I visited Copenhagen Net. Copenhagen has an S bond called the S Tag since 1934, when the first of five radial and a single circumferential route the ring bombing was inaugurated. This map shows both the STOG and the Metro and the points they intersect. The horizontal yellow and green lines belong to the Metro, you're over here, as does the oblong pink line in a circle and the light blue one that runs partially alongside through here. But let's start with just the STOG. Some of the lines in the network, which was built by Danish State Railways or DSB and continues to be operated by the National Railroad, was superimposed on the inner portion of regional and long distance passenger lines, but on totally separate track. Its name is a takeoff on Berlin's S-Bahn, which was copied in many ways, notably not for the type of electrification overhead using overhead instead of third rail. The size and scope of the system, which now measures 110 miles and 138 stations from the inner city into the suburbs has varied through the years from its inception, but generally in the right direction. The network's use of letters to denote the different routes was introduced in 1950. The XTOG is electrified at 1650 volts DC. This view of an outbound STOG train on line C is from the Tofgardes Alla overpass, just one block east of Valby station. The tracks at line, the right serve line B. Trains generally run every 10 minutes, but the headways can be more frequent in rush hours. Nye Ellabjerg station on the A and E lines from a pedestrian overpass that connects with the certain French F line. The STOG's rolling stock consists of 104 H car train sets and 31 four car ones made up of articulated units built by Alstom and Siemens starting in 1996. The reason they look so plump is that they have curved sides. These are fourth generation of STOG cars and a fifth generation to be fully automatic is scheduled to be introduced by 2030. The low level platforms for DSB regional service are at left. The curve size of the rolling stock is shown clearly in this photo from the internet at Copenhagen's central station. This is the Banlo station 
which is one of the transfer points between the STOG, the platform lines C and H are at left, and the metro lines one and two. So let's give a closer look to Copenhagen's totally automated metro. The first line was opened in 2002, and with the addition of new lines and extension, the system has now grown to four routes with 39 stations covering a length of 10 miles. The network works in tandem with the STOG, and there are five stations where transfers can easily be made. The rolling stock consists of 64 three-car trains in two batches manufactured by Ansaldo Brader and its successor, Hitachi Rail Italy. The trains have open gangways. Current collection is from Third Rail Energize at 750 volts. All of the station platforms have screen doors, much like airport people movers. With automated operation, trains run 24 hours a day. Take that, New York City, you're no longer unique. In rush hours, service can be frequent as every two minutes. This view is near the tunnel portal where Route 2, the line that runs to the airport, enters Lurgos Sparken Station. A view from the island platform at Orastad Station on line one. The existence of an elevated structure does not seem to have discouraged the construction of modern buildings. So here from Sunby, two stations further inbound on line one is an area ripe for development. This was the last day of our visit. Back in 2016 on my wife's 80th birthday at the end of a Baltic cruise, I arranged for a surprise party for her with our children and grandchildren flying to Copenhagen for the occasion. It took place in this Thai restaurant. Although our respective wives Claire and Monica could not be with us. Carl Heinz and I celebrated the end of a very successful trip at the same venue this past July 30th. This concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I took pleasure in preparing it and as much as I enjoyed my visit to Scandinavia last July. Stay tuned for Harvey Lehner's video of one of the world's most interesting and charming bygone network of interurban lines.